Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining myself, Jade Burke, a journalist at HR Grapevine today for an HR Grapevine and Topia webinar entitled Connecting Talent Management and Global Talent Mobility Before, During and After COVID-19. The coronavirus crisis has forced businesses around the world to think about how best to access the very best talent out there in order to, to stay competitive in the current climate, something many employers are craving now. However, it can be difficult to connect up strategic talent planning with operational mobility delivery. As such, today's webinar will therefore arm you with plenty of information, including some of the best practices and recommendations for bridging those gaps and what the current climate actually means for you. I am joined today by Steve Black, Chief Strategy Officer at Topia, who helped co-found the business back in 2011. As part of his role with the company, Steve leads strategic initiatives leveraging deep industry technology and customer insight. As an expatriate himself, having originally been from the US, Steve has a keen understanding of global talent mobility. In addition, Topia's Director of Customer Success, Natalie Agostino, will also be joining us. Natalie leads the EMEA Customer Success Team at Topia, working in partnership with HR clients to empower them to deploy, manage and engage employees worldwide. Plus, thanks to over 14 years experience in global mobility, Natalie is well versed in the design and implementation of policies and processes, compensation accumulation and reporting and technology operations and compliance management. Throughout the duration of the webinar today, we do encourage you to use the question function to put forward any questions you may have for both Steve or Natalie. Plus, please do ensure you take part in the two polls that will be launching within the next hour. So without further ado, I would like to hand over to our speakers to discuss this topic further. Wonderful. Well, thank you, Jade, uh, for the introduction. Uh, great to, to be here with everyone. Uh, Natalie, good to, uh, good to chat again today and look, looking forward to the conversation. So, so I think the uh, as Jerry alluded to, you know, we're going to spend today really talking about um, what talent management and talent mobility uh, can do for each other, how we bridge that gap, and what this uncertain times that we continue to live in uh, with no real end in sight uh, mean for how mobility teams can partner with the rest of the business to to keep delivering. So. We'll talk a little bit uh, to start around why it's important uh, to bridge the gap between talent management and global talent mobility. We'll spend some time talking around best practices and, and recommendations for, for connecting the dots uh, and also spend some time reflecting on looking back uh, as the COVID crisis has evolved and also looking forward to what it means for mobility programs around the world and leave you guys with some top tips uh, and, and thoughts uh, around building the, the case for change. So uh, before we get into uh, the, the, the meat of today's conversation and, and as Jade alluded to, we've got a couple of polls uh, spaced throughout to, to keep the audience engaged. Um, I, I thought I'd spend maybe just a couple of minutes doing a bit of scene setting uh, and then we'll get into discussion and uh, and get going from there. So. To, to get us started, I think if there's anything uh, that 2020 has proven, it is that change is the new normal. Uh, I remember when everybody was uh, was worried about Brexit. Uh, I think lots still are, though that's fallen you know, to second or third priority uh, in many cases, it seems. Uh, and what we've seen in organizations is, is now more than ever, you know, talent strategy is ultimately why we're going to win or lose. Um, so we need to be adaptable and agile organizations need to engage a really diverse employee population and give them the opportunity to drive business forward and really make sure that, you know, from a mobility perspective, we're doing everything we can to develop and retain that top talent that we've fought so hard to get uh, and, you know, work with them over the course of their career journey as they maybe work in different roles, different offices uh, and in different types of, of working arrangements. So I think the all of this change and all of this conversation around agility, around talent, uh, is coming at a time when we were already shifting into a, a real focus around talent. Uh, so heading into the year, you know, there was a real concern and real scarcity of talent um, from a CEO perspective. There were you know, all these conversations around the impact of technology and automation and what that meant for, for reskilling uh, existing employees. 
we had been seeing continued year-on-year -year growth um, as expats in different sizes and shapes uh, were growing at nearly 6% annually. Obviously, you know, I think this year we'll see a bit of a dip or a bit of a flat line. Though from most organizations we're talking to, uh, there has been a pause in mobility, of course, with borders closed, but most of those moves are, are still going ahead just later, later this year. And uh, the next challenge may be um, the supply chain uh, bottleneck as borders start to open and everybody wants to get their key hires and, and relocations underway. Uh, and then last but not least, you know, everything we do from a, from a talent or from a mobility perspective has to be done with this lens of a very diverse workforce. We've got four generations working uh, together today with very different sort of needs, desires, and priorities when it comes to what matters uh, as they think about career growth and, and career development. And I think the exciting thing for us, you know, spending our, our days in the global talent mobility space and industry is that there's a real opportunity uh, for mobility to play a critical role helping empower HR teams, deploying, managing, and engaging employees around the world. Uh, I think for some organizations, they've already made this leap uh, towards strategic. Uh, for others, they're, they're all earlier in that journey, uh, heavily operational, as is, is, is much mobility. And if, if you don't get the operations right, it's tough to make those next few steps. Uh, but we're hearing a lot of conversation, a, a big spotlight being placed on mobility, and a lot of interest in uh, how do we make it more strategic and how do we really closely tie it to talent management and, and the employee journey. So uh, to, to set the scene maybe for some of our conversation, uh, Jade, if you don't mind launching the first poll, what we wanted to do was get an initial pulse check. Uh, so how does global talent mobility function at your company and where do you see it on that spectrum of operational uh, to sometimes involved in strategic talent planning uh, to a really core part of talent strategy embedded in planning stages all the way through to, through to delivery. So we'll give everyone a, a few seconds to, uh, to chime in here uh, with their responses and then we'll open up the discussion with Natalie. Just give you all a couple more seconds to um, place your answers on that one. Thanks, Jane. Okay, I think that's enough time if we could release. Right, so, um, right, so according to 40% of you, mobility is purely operational. Um, for 57% of you, mobility is sometimes involved in strategic talent planning. And then for 2% of you, mobility is a heavily involved in strategic talent planning. I'll just pass it back over to Natalie now to, um, to discuss those results. That's great. Thanks, uh, thanks, Jade, for for that. Um, I think I'm not surprised uh, at the overall, I guess, shape of of the responses. Though I'm I'm probably a little bit surprised by the the two percent number. Uh, I expected that one maybe to be a, a little bit higher, but recognize lots of folks are early in their journey. So, Natalie, it, it it'd be great, you know, to get your perspective on whether you're surprised or not, and and how that sort of gels with what you're seeing as you know you're spending a a, a bunch of time uh, of yours on the front lines with a lot of our customers. Uh, all right. I think you may be on mute, Natalie. Got it. That's such a that's such a, a techie rookie mistake. <laughs> so, <laughs> no problem. Yeah, so I completely agree. Uh, we are we're absolutely across our customer base. We we are seeing actually pretty well aligned with this kind of forty percent operational, fifty seven percent somewhat involved. Because I think the majority of our customers are are on. Uh, the sort of beginning to middle of their journey towards kind of full maturity in terms of aligning uh, talent, mm. workforce planning, um, mobility, compliance, business traveler tracking, all of those things together. It's a lot, right? Um, yeah. And uh, and most of our customers are kind of on that journey. I mean, actually, as you start to involve uh, software and technology that helps to support your operational activities, the likelihood is that you're thinking more about these things, but also means that you're either in the middle of managing that in the best way or you're or, or rather planning to manage that in the, in the best way or you're already moving into a strategic conversation or trying to disentangle yourself from the ops in order to be more strategic so that 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 feels pretty normal across uh, across most of the customers that i speak to 
um, but also I would say generally across the industry. I think anybody who's uh, who's listening today will probably feel the feels about aligned with the kind of conversations that they have with their uh, with their colleagues and their peers. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd, I'd say it's not it's not surprising. It's maybe a, a, a little sad because I think we've we've got lots of expertise in the room, lots of uh, really uh, smart folks who understand the impacts of decision making and how it would be uh, generally better for everybody if we could get involved in those decisions much right. earlier in the process and be part of a workforce planning group, for instance. Um, or be aligned in terms of kind of overall strategic planning, both from an annual perspective and maybe from a much longer term kind of succession planning perspective. Um, but, mm -hmm. you know, these things come with time, I guess. <laughs> and I, I know, obviously, um, before you joined us at Topia, you were running the mobility program at the British Council, uh, and we're going through a, 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 this journey there as well. So it, it'd be interesting maybe to, to share a little bit of your perspective on on how you approach that journey and trying to go from operational to more strategic and, and partnering with the business on that. So if you could share any any sort of reflections looking back on on that journey and, and, and what worked and maybe what was a bit of a challenge, that'd be great. Yeah, I mean I could I could definitely share some more stories about kind of being on both sides of the uh, of the kind of service provider client relationship for sure. Um, and yeah. I think so when I joined Bush Council, actually, um, we we were very much looking at a very um, kind of tactical, operational, transactional relationship with the business from uh, the mobility team's perspective. And you had a lot of, you know, very smart, very capable people who really understood what uh, the makeup of an assignment would be and what the impact of kind of one decision over another would be. So, for instance, because the British Council has a very, a very wide and very complex footprint. Um, you know, we quite often get, can I send this person to Kenya on Monday, please? Um, which, you know, I think for anybody today, that's just not going to happen. Um, so, you know, so we'd, we'd get a lot of that and we'd, you know, we'd kind of have a lot of discussions around and about, you know, within the advisor pool, you know, perhaps if you could involve us a little earlier in the conversation, we could help you to plan for that. Um, and some of the feedback that we got from across the business was, oh, mobility always feels like it's getting in the way. You know, um, there's, a, there's always a compliance mm. issue that you're, you're kind mm. of putting in our way. Actually, so what we found was that by kind of re-engaging with those stakeholders and thinking about mobility as a strategic and talent-led function um, and building it out so that we actually had layers of functionality in the team, we were able to deliver something that business really valued because actually we could talk about how can we do the thing that you would like to do rather than here's reasons why you can't do that because it causes compliance issues or operational issues, et cetera. Yeah, I find it's it's always an interesting one that that balancing act of uh, you know policemen, which at the end of the day is a, is a big part of the job, right? Of a mobility team is make sure the the, the business and the employees don't get in trouble as they're uh, going around the world. And the worst thing that can happen is you know getting stopped at a border, or kicked out of a country, or, or you know suffering a compliance a compliance penalty. Yeah, I, I guess any any thoughts around or recommendations for for folks listening around how to you know engage maybe leaders in the business how, how to sort of almost market mobility uh, back to the business in terms of hey here's why we're doing the things we're doing here's how it protects you but also here's the th sort of strategic things that, that we can partner you know was it a lot of one-on-one -on -one conversations was it you know it, would you recommend sort of doing video testimonials even just within the business i guess and any any thoughts or top tips there yeah, I mean, uh, so all of the above, and I think it's important to recognise that every organisation is different. Um, you know, so, in my previous life, I was a, I was, I was one of, well, was one of those consultants at the big four, um, and uh, you know, and, and I would have the same kind of conversations with my clients there as, as I found myself having with myself when mm. I was at Bush Council. You know, every stakeholder has a different uh, kind of uh, kind of point of influence that's going to be important to them. Um, and they may not all be the same. And the thing that, that really drove people's attention at British Council was about employee experience, employee engagement, um, and making sure that people really felt valued, uh, which was great. And it was a really it was a really positive HR environment to be around on that very basis. But I've worked with other companies where you know cost was the driver, and um, or about preparing for adequate succession planning, and so you know figuring out what's your driver and of course the best way to do that is to go and ask the people who who drive that in the business um 
so you know we hear a lot about getting a seat at the table i think that's always a, a hot topic in hr and it's kind of an easy thing to say and not necessarily an easy thing to do so one thing that i found that really worked was to go and just take people for coffee chats and water cooler conversations and then you know they would realize there wasn't the kind of big bad evil kind of compliance wolf and maybe actually it was okay to, to talk to me about their plans and then they would introduce me to somebody else and I kind of broke down walls kind of mm. one person at a time and sometimes it's, it, it's literally that granular yeah. and sometimes you can just say hey I've got something really worthy to add here can I have a seat at the table and um, that tends to be in the more mature HR organizations and it's not always the case but there's nothing wrong with literally just going and speaking one-to-one -one with people and finding out what makes them tick. No, absolutely. I think I think that's a, a great point. And, and, you know, so much of it is it, that I've seen is, you know, certainly heads of lines of business, folks that have been through it a few times, you know, the more times they've had mobility experiences, either personally or within their teams, the more they understand the why behind some of the time and cost and everything else. Whereas if it's maybe a first time mobility for the individual or for the line of business that's trying to get a budget approved, uh, there's, a, there's a lot more education to do in terms of, hang on a second, why, why is this thing take so long and, and is so expensive? Uh, so I, I think that's actually a, a nice transition uh, into the, the, the next topic here. And, uh, you know, reflecting a little bit, if I go back 10, 15 years, you know, much of the reason I think we've seen uh, mobility seen as less strategic and, and more operational has been almost the the percentage of the employee population that mobility touches so it, you know if you think back you know go back 20 years mobility was pretty limited mostly executive ex, expats long-term assignments multi-million dollar costs um, and it was you know less than a percent of your employee population so highly operational didn't impact that many people and as we've gone over the last you know 15 years we've seen this explosion of policy types of self-initiated moves and the definition of mobility expanding and in parallel to that the responsibilities of mobility teams expanding uh, in line with that as well owning permanent transfers cross-border recruiting and and more and more with this trend of globalization uh, we've seen a lot of those you know spikes and that has put a big demand on mobility uh, to, to scale in line with that growth and as we were heading into 2020 I would have said the next thing on the horizon for mobility teams uh, is business travel right it's been a hot topic for the last last three, four years uh, heading into this year. Uh, occasionally, I found a mobility function that was owning it. Uh, oftentimes, it was in the early conversations of we know we've got a problem coming, whether posted workers finally going to be the thing that does it or, or, or something else. Uh, and then 2020 happened, and it sort of seems like we've skipped uh, for briefly the, the business travel conversation as you know, airplanes around the world have, have uh, been, been grounded. But interestingly, now we've seen the spotlight shine on mobility around this concept of remote work, working from home, right? As this as this pandemic and, and this crisis has evolved from first question is, you know, where are my employees, right? Evolving then to, okay, now what do my work from home and remote working policies mean for compliance, for payroll, for immigration, for, for tax and, and on down the line? So it's, it's, and in parallel to that, right? If you think about the percentage of employees that potentially now are in a flexible working arrangement like working from home, that can be the vast majority of your employee population, right? So over a decade, we've gone from, you know, mobility looking at or touching two to 5% of the employee population to over half in many organizations almost overnight and with its own uh, set, of, set of challenges and headaches that come with that. And I think then, well, even if that wasn't enough, <laughs> layering on top of that, we're also seeing a number of other headwinds that are making you know, expectations increase and, and pressure increase on mobility from the rest of the business. So whether that's governments being tighter on, in, on implementing and, in, and making folks adhere to uh, compliance regulations that might have been in place for decades, obviously cost pressure never goes away, even in the best of times. Uh, I think COVID has certainly just added to that. Uh, at, but all at the same time that talent is paramount, employees are why we win uh, in, in a competitive world, and we can't uh, do all of this at the detriment of that experience and invest whatever money we're spending and have folks walking out the door. Uh, and then, you know, there had been a lot of conversation the last couple of years around this topic of agile and more flexible planning. Uh, I think we've seen COVID again shine a spotlight on that of, all right, we've done, you know, 
dozens of scenario plans over the last four months of planning and replanning and uh, redeployment and, and all sorts of things. So in some ways, this perfect storm of massive increase in responsibility, you know, combined with increased pressure across the business. So, and I think ultimately this all boils down to more responsibility, um, maybe more of that seat at the table you're talking about, uh, Natalie, but also more pressure on, on mobility team. So I, I know I crammed a, a lot into one slide, <laughs> slide there, but uh, I'd be interested on, you know, how you're seeing this, you know, manifest itself in conversations with, with customers or, or from your past lives as well. Um, you know, how are people going on this journey and thinking about this new weight of responsibility that's coming their way? Yeah, I mean, it's a great question. I think, you know, it's, it's a trying time for, for our HR in general right now. And mobility is, is the kind of tip of the spear in terms of um, ensuring people's safety, ensuring their security, managing the compliance, um, you know, making, making some pretty important decisions about whether people should stay where they are or be, go back home, um, what happens about their allowances while they're there. How will those things be taxed? Will there be special arrangements put in place by tax authorities for this period? How do we register for that? Um, you know, that's that's very you know complex. Um, and I think you know the fact that, that that there's a lot to talk about in one slide. I think really it kind of captures the concept that mobility is covering you know a lot of ground. Um, and I think the recent crisis has really highlighted just how much there is to do um, and how quickly we need to be able to deploy solutions. Um, certainly what I'm hearing from our customers right now is that they are being pulled in lots of different directions um, yeah. and being asked to make decisions quickly. And, um, you know, we, we had a, 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 a virtual summit last week uh, with uh, one of our uh, customers on the panel um, who's a head of mobility at Equinor and she was telling us about um, how uh, the, the sort of CEO spotlight was very much on what's happening in mobility and how quickly can we deploy people and what's the right way to do that and how can we make sure that that that, it, that our, our people are being looked after but also that we're concerning ourselves with what happens after this period. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and and the, the really interesting dichotomy of that is that you know we've got we've got kind of this end of the, the kind of strategic conversation happening at very senior levels in the organization and at the operational level I, you know i've also had feedback from customers where you know mobility has been told that you know although the operational side of this stuff isn't that important you know it's just admin we'll we'll get to it um you know it's lists and and you know surely somebody's got data somewhere and um, so this, this kind of interesting dichotomy of super strategic, need to be able to have all the answers, need to have your finger on the button, um, need to understand the, the, the pressures that come with having moved somebody to, a, to perhaps a high COVID area or somewhere where, you know, medical insurance is, you know, a, a real pressure point. Mm -hmm. um, or people who, who, who routinely go commute cross border, for instance, um, you know, how will we manage that? Um, what does remote work mean now? Uh, are you establishing some kind of permanent establishment by opening your laptop somewhere in a hotel room um, so all of those kind of compliance or strategic conversations happening alongside physically where are these people and who's retaining that data and is that is that the bit that's important and who determines that level of importance and how are you having those conversations uh, with those senior people so they do recognize that the two things go together yeah, and it's interesting. I was uh, at a virtual, of course, as everything is these days, uh, event yesterday with about a dozen, uh, you know, mobility leaders, and a lot of the conversation there was around this uh, planning for the the new normal, right? Whatever that is, and and however long it goes, uh, there there's been this great, in a way, CEO leadership at organizations around the world, um, you know, making this shift to, hey, hang on a second this remote working thing is, is working pretty well. Let's give our employees choice, right? You can come back if you want. And we've seen, you know, Twitter and other organizations saying, if you never want to come back to the office, that's, that's fine too. And the, the, the conversation with the mobility teams were, was uh, effectively, that's great when you say that at a conceptual level, but have we, have we started to really think through practically what does that mean and what are the implications of that right if what if you know uh, employees take that at face value and say hey i'm going to move you know to the maldives open up my laptop and work from there all of a sudden what's the permanent establishment risk right of accidentally creating a, a taxable entity in, in a new location around around the globe 
or where employees are um, commuting across state lines, you know, whether that's, we've seen a lot of movement from California to Nevada, you know, given income tax um, changes, or even if you look at people who are, had been commuting into New York City, now working from home in New Jersey or Connecticut or, or the surrounding states, it opens up a whole new can of worms around what's the employee's responsibility, what's the organization's, um, making sure you don't underpay tax, but also making sure you don't overpay tax, right? And we've seen some interesting stuff coming out of New York around their uh, unincorporated business tax, uh, where you know hedge funds and, and the like are actually able to save millions once they know their employees actually aren't commuting into the city and, and, and working from home. So um, we'll, we'll probably see, again, adjustments by governments to try and collect some of that back or change rules and regulations uh, to, to, to make the most of it. Uh, but, but I think it is that how do you partner with leadership teams in this phase where everybody's itching to get out um, a statement or a point of view around remote working and working from home. I guess any any sort of thoughts, Natalie, or, or recommendations for um, folks that are thinking about how to have that conversation with leadership of, hey, hang on, have you thought about these three to five things, let's make sure we've really done our research or, or at least put a plan in place to build a policy, uh, even if it's a little bit uh, back to front. Any any recommendations or, or thoughts there? Yeah, I mean, I think it's about data, right? Uh, and I mean, we've been talking for a long time, uh, well, in business in general, but especially in HR about the, the importance of data and how to present data and big data. But actually, you know, putting all of that aside and just thinking about uh, the information that we have about our employees that we store in all the different places in which we store it. Yeah. And, uh, you know, the majority of people who are who are listening today will probably have some some kind of HRIS in place. Um, but the likelihood is, is that it, it, it can't because most don't go into the level of detail that you require to manage assignment data or kind of yeah. cross border uh, data. So, you know, nobody wants to present a 5,000 line spreadsheet to the CEO. He or she definitely doesn't want to look at that. So, you know, but, but then it's how do you make that interesting and engaging for that person so they can recognize where those things are important? And um, so it goes back to that. First of all, what are the things that make your stakeholder tick? And if and if you're lucky enough to have a seat at the table with the CEO, then what is it that he or she is really interested in? And the likelihood is, is what's costing me money? Um, you know, how can I make sure that I'm engaging my most uh, talented people? Um, and where's my risk? You know, and if those are your three key drivers, then you know that's pretty easy to go back to your data and say, okay, where are my people? Is something likely to be breaching a level of cost that I wasn't expecting? Um, and is something breaching a level of compliance that I wasn't expecting? And how can I highlight that? And that might you know, be about visualizations. Mm -hmm. It might be about traffic lights. It might be about just being able to have a, 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 a punchy conversation about those things. But you can't do it without the data. Yeah, no, I think that's great. And, and I think there's, there's a bit of that, um, how do we get the data paired with this even the you know the three bullet points, which is maybe all the attention I'll get from a, from a CEO who's trying to do a thousand things at the moment, of you know here are things to be be mindful of or where we have risk as as we enter these new flexible working arrangements. It's people that are working in a different state or a different country. I was talking recently to to someone in in Switzerland, and 80% of their employee population commutes in. Uh, they're based in Basel, either from France or from Germany, right? And so all of a sudden working from home is literally working in a different country um, and, and, and lots of implications around that. But it's it's that state lines, it's the health and safety angle potentially to some of this employee data and, and reopening of offices. Um, and it's this visibility um, and, and risk as uh, we offer new flexibility. And if that means people start moving, then it opens up the risk and the challenge to anywhere on earth and, and, and the associated things around it. So I think a lot of it's 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 not an easy solve, uh, certainly, but getting the conversation started, I think, sooner rather than later for organizations is going to be key. And then building out a plan to formalize policies, do the research, and and, and get advice, uh, right? I think we're seeing so far governments in on the, on the whole being pretty reasonable about people who've been stuck in, in, in locations, et cetera. But as we start to shift, a subtle but important shift from you must work at home to you can, right, all of a sudden that choice angle comes into play. And I think we'll see governments going at 
you know, collection of, of taxes anywhere and everywhere that they can, uh, right, a, 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 as we go through this uh, this journey. So I expect a lot of the rest of this year to be policy creation and definition and, and sort of iteration at organizations about what is what does the new way of working mean for compliance and for mobility teams. And I think tying to that, um, that that talent conversation, which we know is top of mind for the CHRO and, and, the, and the CEO, I think w one of the things, um, and, and that expansion in mobility touching a larger percentage of the employee population, is that I think it's super exciting for mobility is, is the opportunity and the reality that it should be impacting almost all stages of an employee's life cycle, right? So cross-border recruiting or cross-state line recruiting in the U.S., identifying and deploying, you know, existing employees around the world, whether that's your high potential population through management rotations or, or, or other. And I think done right, mobility can absolutely help um, develop and retain staff and extend their careers by many, many years. Done poorly, we've also seen uh, mobility can help push people out the door, per perhaps after you've invested quite a bit in, in, in their mobility experiences. Um, so I, I think the thing for me that it has always been a little bit of a double-edged sword for, for talent mobility has been this reality that it can help in all these different areas. But when you look at all those areas, it doesn't own any of them, right? So it doesn't own recruiting, but it can help make it better. It doesn't own development or retention, but it can help make it better or help make it worse. And that, that influence without ownership um, can often make it a bit of a struggle, right, to, to, to get engaged in the conversation and improve your worth because you're not owning everything end to end. So I, I guess from, from what you see, are there certain pieces of this puzzle where you see maybe mobility getting more traction, having a, more, of a, more of a voice uh, today? So I think you've, you've really hit the nail on the head there, Steve, about actually when you're in mobility, you're kind of jack of all trades, master of none, you know, um, and, and you quite often end up being the, the, the policeman who gets sort of sent in to go and tell people that they can't do something. And I, and, and I remember kind of having conversations in, in my last role where, you know, I kind of find myself always getting stuck having the challenging conversation with the business, and have, you know, and kind of look around and it'd be like one of those silent movies from the 20s and I'd just be sat there on my own, you know, uh, where's everyone gone? Um, yeah, sorry, you can't send your person to Kenya on Monday. I'm really so sorry about that. It's just it's impossible to get work permits in three days. Um, and I think I think it comes down to um, that there are there are areas of HR that, that everybody has specialisms in and mobility touches all of those to some degree right the way through the cycle because the assignment life cycle kind of mirrors the employee life cycle but kind of in microcosm yeah. if you like. So, mm -hmm. you know, an area that's always really, uh, really well supported and tends to gel really well between mobility and that team is is recruitment or, or kind of um, talent identification. So, you know, those processes tend to be really good. We're really uh, engaged and really enthused about getting the right people in the right places, We've got really great processes. We're all on the same page. You know, recruitment always know to come and call mobility to get that work permit sorted and sort out whatever the tax issues are. And then the person yeah. gets there and it just kind of dies because the person's there and maybe they don't feel very comfortable saying that things haven't really gone the way they wanted them to go. They didn't get the apartment they wanted or their spouse isn't happy and it's having an effect on them and their work. Um, maybe they have health issues and they don't know who to turn to and they feel that's too personal to share. And then you've got the other end of the spectrum where we're bringing people back. Well, if you think about the employee life cycle, when people leave, we're kind of like, OK, you've gone now. Thanks for your time and goodbye. Um, and, and it can be really easy to kind of almost have that same mentality about the end of assignments. But we need to be very careful about that because mm -hmm. actually it's not the end of their employment with us. It's, it's actually the start of a whole new cycle of employment with us. And the idea that we're sending top talent, people that we're invent investing a lot of money in you yeah. know assignments on average cost around eight hundred thousand dollars i mean that's an awful lot of money to invest in somebody that you're then going to see walk out the door when they return yeah. so you want to keep that person you want to keep them engaged but often that's somewhere we, we don't invest a lot of time knowledge and expertise and we don't necessarily um pull the pieces together uh, with with the, the two teams mobility and whichever you know hr team would look after that yeah. Um, and it's something that my customers remark on quite a lot currently. 
Yeah, no, I, I think it's a, a really interesting one. Of you, you spend there's there's this sort of grand hurrah and excitement when somebody goes out on assignment or or, or or moves, and I think when they're when they're coming back, there's a there's a positive tendency, right, for the, wherever they've been in the world to give them a you know a farewell party and that, those sorts of things. But if you, if you're not careful, right, it it feels like a goodbye to the company, right, rather than just a goodbye to that location. And then I think the other piece, um, it's one thing if they're going on to another assignment somewhere else in the world and they get the assignment uh, and everything that goes with that, but very different if they're returning back to their home location. And I, and I think certainly where we've seen some organizations struggle is that, you know, the, the, you almost need, I've heard it talked about as a, a reboarding instead of onboarding experience for an employee mm -hmm. returning somewhere. It might have been a few years. People have changed, processes changed, the office might have changed. And so investing in that as much or more than you would a new hire, I think is critical. And we're starting to see, I think, a little bit more of that in, in, in some organizations, but I think there's still uh, a challenge or, or an opportunity there. And to tie it back to, to one of your comments early on, I think there's a there's a key piece for me around data, right? Data is is ammunition. Data uh, can help you know land a point and, and make a case for investment or a case for change. And one of the interesting things is we've seen this proliferation of HR technology uh, has been there's been a lot of great uh, powerful stuff done for employee engagement tools. Uh, Culture Amp is is one that we use internally and a number of organizations do as well uh, and, and there's bits and pieces of that in in a bunch of different systems around the world but there's a risk also certainly for a large enterprise oftentimes they have fragmented you know systems by region or by geography or by entity right and so it's great if you have the holy grail of one hris system globally Sadly, that's that's not the case for, for, for many organizations. And then you end up having these pockets actually of individuals that aren't caught up in your employee engagement surveys and some of your other data because they're bouncing between systems and they get missed out in, in that. And actually the, the key thing for an employee going through this life cycle is that one of the things I really recommend to organizations is uh, you actually need to track that engagement even more closely than your existing employees that aren't uh, going through these mobility experiences because the risk of them becoming disengaged and frustrated is so much higher because of the stress of a relocation and that experience in both directions. And where you can collect that data, then you can start to say, okay, hey, we have a real problem. Maybe it's in repatriation, but it might not be the, the physical move element. It might be that uh, reboarding in the new office, or it might be just staying connected while they're out on assignment, right? And you know, organizations are doing that well. We'll maintain oftentimes a buddy or a partner um, back in the home location to to keep a bit of that uh, that rapport and, and things going. So again, though, it comes down to having the planning to say, okay, hey, this is the, these are the questions we want to answer. Therefore, this is the data we need to be gathering, right? And and that can feel um, can feel like a pretty daunting journey, right? Of okay, I don't have the time or energy to plan a 67 question survey and a multi year data analytics program. Uh, and oftentimes we'll see this, this, uh, the, the what, what happens is over, overwhelmed and then nothing happens. And so my you know, top tip for folks is let's start with the three questions or five questions max. It's, it's manageable, right? It's infinitely better than no data. And you can start to take that first step on the data journey. Uh, and over time, sure, you can get fancier and you can make the case for, you know, complex multivariate analytics, but you know, you'd be surprised with how much you can get done with with a couple of questions uh, and a little bit of uh, Excel from time to time, right? Absolutely, love an Excel graph. It's a really great start. <laughs> right. I mean, and, and I think it's that it's that often is enough data to build the case of, hey, look what we could do on a shoestring budget. Uh, all you have to do is save one employee from leaving, right? And if you think about the cost of backfilling, the cost of lost knowledge, etc. I'll tell you, that's going to pay for your technology, uh, you know, for at least a year, if not more in, in many cases. So on a relative sense, actually, the cost of technology as a portion of the overall program can be can be pretty, uh, pretty minimal for sure. So mm -hmm. I think um, uh, we'll, we'll get folks at the ready here in the audience to uh, chime into our, our, our pulse check uh, number two here. So we've talked a lot about uh, over the last half hour around uh, the evolution of mobility programs, uh, this, this increase in expectations, this challenge and complexity of working from home. Uh, and uh, the, the second question here is, as we move into this new normal, 
you know, whatever that may be, uh, do you think global talent mobility will become more or less important for companies? Uh, so uh, three options, one, decreasing importance, it's gonna be less important than it has been in, in years past, uh, same level of importance or increased importance, uh, even more important than it has been uh, in prior years. So we will give folks here a, a few more seconds uh, to answer that question, and then uh, Jade will share the uh, answers with us. Yeah, thank you, Steve. We'll just give you a couple more seconds on that one. I think that's probably enough time. Great. Perfect. Here we go. Right. So, um, so seventy-two percent of you said that was an increased importance. Nineteen percent said the same level of importance, and eight percent said a decreasing importance. So I'll just pass that back over to you now, Steve, just to discuss those results. That is. Uh, that's great. <clears throat> Thanks, uh, thanks for that, Jade. Yeah, I, I think it is the um, probably pleasantly surprised uh, by by the results uh, on that one. I think the you know the decreased importance as, as I've been out and had conversations with, with with HR leaders and others. There are of course you know some industries that have been really really hard hit. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that the business case for change for some of those as well. But um, I think certainly there have been some where maybe mobility programs are reasonably small. Uh, and you know it may may put a halt to them at least in the short term or, or, or you know really really shrink them back. But I think for most at least what I've been hearing is uh, 2020 will be a bit of a weird year. But as we get back into 21 and beyond, um, the volumes will likely return pretty quickly to what they were. Uh, and in the meantime, we've got a whole host of complexities around this new normal uh, and 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 new responsibilities uh, for mobility teams around this this work from home uh, conversation. So I guess Natalie, any any reactions or, or reflections on on those results? Uh, definitely, uh, really encouraged to see that everybody uh, is uh, well. Okay, seventy two percent of our attendees mm -hmm. uh, are uh, recognizing an increased importance for um, mobility uh, input and activities over the next kind of, I don't know, 12 to 36 months, mm. I think. Because I think, it's, as you say, it's important to think about not just during this kind of intra-COVID period. I don't, I don't think we've got a name for it yet, have we? Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, it, it, it certainly brought to light uh, and made acute a lot of the things that we already knew about. And in some ways, it's kind of made very urgent the things that we kind of allowed to kind of stretch to the bottom of the list. Yeah. Um, but I think also what it what it has done is made it very clear that if we don't have a good base for tackling these things, they become emergencies, and then they suck up ever, all the air from everything else. And what you know is actually potentially a very small part of your employee population suddenly becomes the key focus for everything because yeah. cost is out of control, uh, ability to ensure employee safety and security is out of control, um, and you know we we're not really sure whether we should have people at home, whether uh, working remotely is a, a tax liability situation or isn't. Um, and, and we need to be able to have appropriate planning for those things. So I think everybody, you know, has, has rightly identified that these are that these are the issues. Of course, I think that we, we do need to take into account that um, mobility might mean something different to different companies. Um, mm -hmm. So uh, you, you, you might well be thinking about um, fewer assignments for instance in the traditional sense but you might be thinking actually potentially what we'll do is we'll we'll let people take their laptop wherever they want to go as long as we have some kind of presence that enables yep. us to manage the tax situation um but uh but we'll give them a bunch of cash and it's for them to do as they please and we'll you know talk to our tax advisor or whoever about how we want to do that and then it's kind of up to the employee to do to do whatever they want to do um, or it might be about increased business travel. So maybe actually all we really want to do is manage the compliance um, kind of elements of that. And beyond that, you know, kind of up to you, employee, do as you do as you do and manage that with your align manager. Um, and then, you know, who owns that? Is it HR? Is it tax? Right. Is it mobility? Is it a little bit of all? Do we need some kind of tax force that, that, that kind of sits between all three of those that manages mm. that jointly? Um, and of course, none of these are new 
questions, all right? I mean, I think if we talk about business travellers in particular, nobody's ever really settled the question of who owns that. Yeah. You know, I've been in-house and a service provider several different times in my career. And uh, uh, as Jade was saying earlier, it's been quite a bit more than 14 years now. And in that time, and certainly well before um, I was, you know, a five-year-old in mobility, because I'm really yeah. not that old, promise. Um, you know, it, it was it was a debate then. You know, we've never really settled it yet, and I think that things like the current uh, crisis around COVID really has made uh, kind of laser focus on these things that we've we've been talking about for a long time. Absolutely, and I, and I think it's also added you know a few new things to the mix. There's been a lot of conversation recently around this concept of virtual assignments, right? And, and effectively, you know, for those that haven't haven't heard that term, it's it's effectively going going on assignment from a job perspective without the physical relocation of actually moving to the new country. So I, based in, in the UK, could go on a virtual assignment and start working for our you know, Singaporean entity. Uh, and there's a, a lot of interesting sort of questions around that. They've, they've in some ways started by default as people were gearing up to move in you know, February, March, got caught in the, in the travel cutoffs with COVID. Uh, and effectively had had entered their prior role, had were about to start the new role, and and for the most part have started those roles remotely. Uh, I think many are 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 still planning to go through with the the relocation once they once they can. But it opens this question around, okay, you know, what are the legal and organizational implications of that model, and is that one we should actually be thinking about a, a, as another sort of tool in our bag of, uh, of tricks for mobility uh, of different deployment models. We've got short-term assignment, long-term assignment, and virtual assignment. I think uh, lots of questions to come on you know, the tax uh, imp and compliance implications around that uh, and, and permanent establishment risk as well. But also I think um, some unanswered questions still around the employee, um, I guess the impact of a virtual assignment on employee growth development and organizational understanding versus somebody who is physically going and experiencing that culture um, in, in a true immersion sense, right? It's one thing to be working with, I don't know, Japanese colleagues on Zoom all day, every day. It's a whole nother thing to go live in Tokyo uh, and understand the, the sort of cultural norms and, and behaviors in a way that makes you more effective in business. Um, but it, it, you can't and really are never going to get a, a, across to Zoom. So I think it's one where we'll see some tactical use and, and practical use over the course of this year as people can't start moving. But, and I think for maybe assignments that might have been on the cusp, maybe instead of doing a three-month assignment, short-term assignment, you may do do work remotely and do a virtual assignment. But I think on on the whole, my my view is they're not gonna. It's not gonna be the the thing that takes over mobility and everything goes virtual because I do think so much of that upside and the reason organizations do it does require some of that in-person experience and time, even if it isn't five days a week. Um, there, there's still real real benefit and, and impact. So. Natalie, I don't know if you'd had much in the way of conversations from folks around this virtual assignment concept or uh, too early to tell. Yeah, I, I still at a kind of a conceptual stage, I think. Yeah. People are quite excited about it conceptually because it has the potential to be, you know, um, much cheaper, yeah. uh, potentially easier because you're not physically moving people. It enables dual careers to continue yeah, so you're not absolutely. interfering with family life in the same way um you don't have to interfere with children's schooling or anything like that so there's there's the potential that the more traditional assignment it looks a lot more attractive from that perspective but i think as customers have been looking at the reality of a virtual assignment because we, yeah. we had a bit of a a bit of a scare a couple of years ago didn't we where everybody went oh Mobility is done. Everybody's going to do everything from their laptop from now on. Um, you know, no, there won't be any need for international HR people ever again. Um, yep. And you know, the reality is that that's just not going to happen, is it? Because people need to move. You need to be able to interact. I think something this last few months has taught us is we can all work from home. Here I am. This is me in my home. Um, yep. And you know, we can we we can be very productive at home. But it's just not the same as being in the office and interacting with our colleagues. Uh, and, and sharing office office culture and local culture um, and being able to kind of tactically get through things in the same way. So physical assignments are never going to go away. So th there's probably going to be uh, a little bit more um, thinking it through as we as we think about, 
you know, what's the right kind of assignment for the role? But it goes back to that piece about aligning uh, business requirements and talent and succession yeah. planning, because you probably don't want one of your future leaders to spend their entire time talking to somebody on Zoom. You want to get them out there understanding the different elements of their business and understanding the different business and local cultures um, that, that make up their business. Um, so yes. yeah, it will probably be, it will be a little of both, and that's certainly what I'm hearing now from my customers that they're they're looking at it, but it's not their primary driver. Yeah, no, I think it makes a lot of sense, and and I think to um to to take us home, I know we've got about ten minutes left, and and we'll try and squeeze in a little bit of time for questions if, if we can. But one of the one of the things you touched on there was this um this bringing it back to how do we more closely connect global talent mobility with talent management and the company's talent strategy. So I know uh, you, I'd ask you to put some thoughts down around sort of top tips from, from your experience uh, on how to more closely embed uh, mobility with, with talent management. So I would love you to you know kind of share your thoughts and perspectives and best practices. Sure, well, I'll keep it short because I appreciate that we're, we don't have buckets of time, but I, I would say if anybody does have uh, thoughts about something, you want to talk to me about it, absolutely do feel free to email, really happy to talk about this. Um, so this is just from my experience, guys, so uh, obviously really happy to hear other people too. Um, but yeah, the, the, the really important thing is go out and talk to your business, go and talk to your stakeholders, find out what things they value so that you can be the one to add that value. Um, make sure that you are thinking about process and technology as the things that underpin uh, driving success. And, and enabling you to be that strategic person that the business is really going to value. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, technology is an enabler of that. You know, bad process is bad process, and technology can't fix bad process, but it can certainly make sure <laughs> that, uh, that, that your process is as good as it can be. Um, and, of course, it, it also means that you can use the data that we were talking about uh, in, a, in a variety of different ways to manage your program but also to provide mm. analytics that mean that we can keep drawing out things that are important in a, a management information style that is you know most engaging for your strategic leaders um, obviously you need to get feedback from your employees they're the ones out either on assignment or doing uh, whatever travel it is that they need to do for a business um, and sometimes you've got to take the good with the bad. I don't know how many times I've sat on the phone with employees and heard them moan about the policy um, or, uh, you know, I, I, I don't agree that I don't get to reimburse my bottled water because, you know, whatever, a sad story. You know, sometimes you've got to take the good with the bad um, because at the same time, you'll also get lots of really engaged people who want to tell you about the things that will be um, yeah. that were made better by your team and your ability to deliver the things that only you can deliver. Um, and of course, all of that means that you can um, reduce attrition and make sure that your people stay. When you're investing this level of money, time, resource, energy, you, you want to keep those people. Um, and maybe you don't want to keep all of them. I, I wouldn't want to comment, but, um, but certainly you, you want to keep the good ones, right? Um, and, and they're the ones that you should go after for that feedback and get them to tell your story for you. It's mm. much more powerful to have an employee say what a great experience they had and how much they um, valued being valued um, and that your team was part of that, whichever team that be, whether that be the talent team or the mobility team or, or any other team that was involved in their assignment. Sure. And then, of course, there's the build the business case piece. Um, as, as Steve said before, you know, the the the, the case of technology is very clear and obviously we would say that but I, I think it's important to note that you know I've always believed that even before I even looked at a, a career in the technology industry because it makes your life easier but it's not always easy to translate that into kind of you know dollars and euros and so therefore it's important to go back to that data and think about the things that make your stakeholders tick so that you can think about you know, writing that report or delivering that presentation that really uh, clicks for those stakeholders who, you know, have got to put their hand in their pocket for the money. Yeah, no, no, absolutely. And I think that's one of the things, I, you know, when I've had similar conversations with folks, I think people get the, you know, the goals here and, and the, you know, the aims and often the challenges. It's great. I'd love to bring insights. 
but I'm living in spreadsheets, right? So how do we, how do I, how do I sort of square that with, I need data to make a business case maybe, but also I don't have the data and, and, a, and a little of a challenge. And so one of the things, you know, over the last few months, I've spent a lot of time with different organizations um, all, all across the spectrum of a level of impact of COVID to their business around building that case for change. And I think the, to, to, to sort of bring us home here maybe, um, for, for me, it's about flexing that business case based on your your business reality. It's gonna look and feel different depending on whether you've been hit incredibly hard, right, by COVID, or you've been a fortunate one of the businesses that has had great successes as, as, as a result of people uh, being stuck in their houses and, and uh, streaming Netflix all the time or, or whatever the whatever the case may be. And I think that the, the conversations I've had with folks, you know, maybe on, on one end of the spectrum that have had significant impact to the business, um, th there is do more with less, right? So Hey, you had a big shared service center that was that was helping deliver mobility. Sorry, uh, that's been cut in half, or the team's been furloughed, even if it's temporarily. How are you going to continue to deliver high quality? Because nobody's going to accept that 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 drops, but with a smaller team. Or hey, when I look across all of your mobility spend, I can see you spent you know half a billion dollars last year across you know tax equalization, supply chain, big four spend, and on down the line. So help me uh, help me understand how you can find uh, you know pockets of money within that to help reinvest in, in, the, in the rest of the business. So on that end, it's a big cost savings story. And in, in many cases, you know, once you have the data, then you can start to optimize the supply chain uh, and, and find pockets of money. Or you may find that you're spending quite a bit, you know, with a big four, for example, um, that could be automated and and that can and can relatively quickly pay for itself. Uh, whereas if you're on the other end of the spectrum and perhaps you're really benefiting under this new reality, then you know the opportunity is, okay, how do we tie it much more closely to talent strategy? There are layoffs happening around the globe at some wonderful firms, some great people looking for new roles. How do we think if we're a, a, one of those fortunate organizations, how do we think about finding the best talent on earth, wherever they are, who, who's uh, been impacted by this, this crisis and bringing them into our organization? Maybe day one is, is is starting remotely, and then once borders start to reopen, uh, getting them to, to to where they need to be, right? And so I think that that you shift more towards the talent story, though. Obviously, if you can save cost, uh, I think that 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 benefits everyone, and, and everyone's interested from that perspective. So, just um, just sort of a few thoughts there around flexing that business case. Is I've had a lot of folks asking me, you know, how can this look like? How can I invest or or convince my CFO maybe to invest in something? When we've been adversely impacted, I think it's about showing how it how it pays back and and actually helps the organization uh, more broadly as well. So I guess in the um, last couple of minutes here, uh, maybe Jade will take uh, one uh, one question uh, if we've got any that have come in. And as Natalie mentioned before, our email is here on the screen. So please feel free uh, if you want to have a further chat or follow up on any items. Uh, we're we're at your disposal and and always happy to uh, to discuss. Thank you, Steve. Yes, yeah, so we've got about a couple of minutes left. So if we go with um, this question, how important do you see business travel tools going forward with so little travel happening now? Uh, that, that, that's a great, great question. Thanks, Jade. I think um, we could probably spend a, a half hour on that one alone, but the, the two minute version and the time we have here, I think for me is one, um, particularly in Europe with posted worker regulations finally going into effect, even with some of the uncertainty around them uh, this summer, the percentage or the number of employees uh, that are touched and have a compliance uh, component to their travel, even if it's for a day, uh, is, is shooting up you know, uh, exponentially this year versus last. So even with the percentage of your employee population traveling less, the, the requirements and the, the uh, compliance just got more complicated. I think the other piece of the puzzle is we're seeing some interesting health and safety use cases uh, for some of that employee location uh, tracking uh, data and tools, uh, uh, particularly as organizations start to reopen and are, and are wondering maybe who's who's traveled to uh, a COVID hotspot as you have spikes in the U.S. or, or other parts of the world as well. So, uh, you know, business travel may take certainly into next year to pick back up, but I think there are a number of use cases uh, that are still going to get folks, you know, pushing towards a, a, looking at a solution and getting something in place as we uh, as we head into uh, into next year. 
So uh, I guess with that, um, you know, appreciate everyone's time uh, today joining the session. Uh, hopefully you found the conversation insightful, helpful, maybe picked up a, a few top tips or, or, or things to uh, think about uh, as you look towards uh, next year. Uh, and please feel free to get in touch. Thank you, Steve. Um, I just want to obviously thank everyone for listening and taking part in the polls today and the Q&A discussion. Um, with special thanks, of course, to both Steve and Natalie today for this interesting exploration into global talent mobility. Um, as Steve mentioned, the contacts are on the screen now, so, so feel free to get in touch with the guys there. Um, also, don't forget, we'll also be sending a recording of the webinar out for you to listen to uh, today. Um, and I'd just like to have, wish you all a great afternoon, and we look forward to welcoming you back to additional webinars in the future. Thank you.